Welcome, everyone, to another Catholic Family News special report. I'm Brian McCall, the editor-in-chief of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined by uh, the eminent scholar and uh, uh, public speaker, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, who many will know who read our monthly newspaper because many of his articles have appeared in Catholic Family News. So welcome to our program today. Thank you, Brian. It's good to be on again. Yes, it's good. Good to see you. And uh, again, for those who read the paper, some, some outstanding articles over the past year or so. It's really nice to actually see and you get to meet someone here uh, who is you know, behind maybe the text you've read. Right. Uh, but today we're here to talk about a, a new book uh, that has just just hot off the presses. And I have mine uh, here. And it's uh, from Benedict's Peace to Francis's War as a, uh, a great title. I love the title when I saw I saw that. Uh, it's a uh, a new war and peace, let's say. So, <laughs> yes. uh, maybe be as famous as the original war and peace. Um, but this book obviously deals with a topic we've had several programs on Catholic Family News about uh, Traditionis Custodes, uh, the document issued motu proprio by Pope Francis, which uh, essentially severely restricts uh, the access to the traditional Latin mass. Uh, and this was issued on July 16th, uh, this past summer. So why don't you tell us a little bit, you're as the editor of the book, so you pulled together uh, a book. And I warn our readers, it, it's, a, it's a hefty book, uh, 400 and some pages, but each of the contributions are actually fairly short. Some of them are only two or three pages. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very easy to read because you can pick it up, read one or two contributions in a, a short period. So uh, it's kind of the best combination. It's thorough but it's also very, very readable. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the origin of the book project? How did this come together? And, and uh, what was your reasons for doing it? Sure, Brian. Um, yeah, so, so when, when, when the Moda Proprio came out on July 16th, the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, um, there was, uh, I mean, not surprisingly, but there was an instant reaction around the world to this Moda Proprio. Uh, even on the same day, some very important articles were published uh, the following day and the following week and the following month, this flood, the floodgates were open uh, from all different perspectives. But interestingly enough, and, and I've, I've read quite extensively the reactions at, at this point, hundreds of, of reactions, uh, the majority of the reactions were critical, um, either severely critical or just pointing out the the folly of this move at this time and in the way in which it was done. Uh, even there were even progressives and liberals saying that kind of thing. But in any case, um, there, were, there was a flood of reaction to it. And I was struck again and again, it became almost a daily routine by the quality of these responses, by the careful thinking, the eloquent writing, the, the argumentation, you know, the historical information, right? I mean, the, for example, just to take one tiny example, uh, the, uh, you know, the claim that, I mean, Pope Francis's motu proprio and the accompanying letter are just full of errors. They're full of erroneous statements, falsehoods, provable falsehoods. Um, you know, he talks about Pius the, the fifth as creating a new missile, you know, practically ab ovo or, you know, yes. uh, like, like, uh, uh, Athena springing from the head of Zeus, uh, on the papal <laughs> throne, you know, uh, and, and this is just false. And so it, it was really wonderful to see how the Catholic how the mystical body of Christ, in a sense, was trying to expel this virus, you know, that that had been introduced into it, uh, to use a kind of topical metaphor, right? Um, mm. So ha having no, that, that's that a good point, because that one, I remember the day reading it, you know, it's kind of like, where were you when this happened? But yeah, yeah, yeah. that was one of the things that jumped out at me, because I thought, forget, even whatever your position is on the mass, the traditional mass, I mean, it's just historical falsehood. I mean, to propagate right. a, a, something that even an historian who doesn't like the traditional mass would have to say, well, that's just not true history. Mm -hmm. It's just, it was shocking to read in a paper yes. document. Yeah, and in yes. fact, in fact, quite yeah. apart from questions of justice and charity, it's an embarrassment for the papacy. Yes. I mean, it's a historic yes. embarrassment. It's going to be something that that we all sort of shake our heads about in the future. You know, it, 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 the, the future historians will look back at this. The Ludwig Pastors of the future who are writing about the, the papacy, yeah. uh, they'll just be ashamed. But yes. in any case, so with all of these reactions that come out and... Uh, I made lists of them at, at New Liturgical Movement. I made a post with, you know, 50 articles after a week. And then I made another post and another post and another post, you know. Uh, and so it, 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 it hit me. This was around uh, the beginning of September. It, it, it hit me that 
it's becoming almost overwhelming. There's somebody needs to collect the best and brightest of all this work, the, the most appreciated, the most interesting, the most eloquent, not necessarily the most famous, although that was often the case too, but just, just to gather, you know, the best fruits of these responses into one volume. Um, because I mean, even if people read the internet avidly, um, you know, the, the, the material in this book is drawn from probably, you know, 45 different places. Uh, you know, uh, many of these things were published on the internet, most of them, but in 45 different places. Uh, and similarly, you know, there are pieces in here that were never published. We can talk about that in a moment, mm. because it's not all republication. There are some fresh pieces in here. Um, but in any case, I thought it would be really nice to have it uniformly typeset, you know, elegantly laid out, yes. you know, put in chronological order. That's another interesting thing about the book. Everything is put not in order of hierarchy. So it's not like first the cardinals, then the bishops, then the, the priests, right. then the lay people, but it's by date. And so what you can see is the evolving reaction and how also the people reacting react to each other, because there are some interesting internal debates going on in these pieces as well. You raise a point there I'd like to talk about. Uh, the, the book is incredibly diverse. You already point out in terms of authors. So there are uh, prelates, princes of the church, ordinary priests, lay people, um, really the, the, the gamut. But in terms of, it's not just each piece repeating the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there's a general agreement, I think, among the authors that there's a problem here, right? They're yes. not, not supporting yes. it. But there, there seems to be a variety of approaches to what we do about it or what we make of it. So is, right. is that your impression? How could you that, elaborate on that? that that's correct. Yes. Um, so for example, we have five cardinals in this book. Um, mm -hmm. No one, I think, will be surprised at their names. Brand, Müller, Burke, Müller, Sara, and Zen. Yes. Um, but, but even within that group, uh, you know, Cardinal Burke is famous for his advocacy of the Usus Antiquior. Yes. Uh, but Cardinal Müller is not so famous for that. He celebrates it rarely. Um, he seems to be very content with the Novus Ordo, mm -hmm. uh, and yet he also saw the 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 the, the folly and the injustice um, of this decision. Um, similarly, with the bishops, uh, Archbishop Hector Aguer, mm -hmm. Archbishop Gulixen, Archbishop Vigano, uh, Bishop Mutzertz from uh, a Dutch bishop, and Bishop Schneider. Um, you know, again, there's even within that group, which would be considered highly conservative, there are diverse opinions. One of the archbishops says he only celebrates the Novus Ordo, that's uh, Aguer. And, uh, you know, and with and we know with 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 other ones, they, they only celebrate the traditional mass. So it's uh, and, and then with the lay people, the same kind of of dynamics play out. We have some some conservatives here who are very much into the reform of the reform and they and they cheer on Benedict the 16th everything he did and said mm -hmm. um, and then you've got some other perspectives that are even critical of Benedict the 16th not of course critical in the same way as as we are of, yes. of Francis yes. but but just pointing out some of the some of the weaknesses and incoherences in the Sumorum Pontificum position the, the the reality is and this is getting a little bit off topic but the Sumorum Pontificum piece, the piece of the title, Pax Benedictina, um, yeah. was a tenuous piece. It, it, it was like it was like a ceasefire between hostile forces, right? And I mean, it was more fire, like the Edict of Milan. It wasn't promoting Christianity as the state mm -hmm. religion, but tolerating it. It's, right. Is my my analogy. That, that's a good analogy. Yes. Very yes. good analogy. Um, yeah, and so so in a way, there was a tenuous or fragile piece. It was a it was an attempt to live and let live, you know, uh, and, you know, as time goes on, it becomes increasingly clear that um, there are profound theological, liturgical, canonical, moral issues involved in these debates that you, you can't just put them on the shelf or you, you can't just politely ignore them. They, they will come out. They've come to the fore. And that's one of the that's one of the blessings in disguise of Traditionis Custodes. Hmm. It, 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 I mean, it felt like a kick in the gut to the millions of Catholics who, who love the tradition of the church, but it also really exposed the progressive liberal modernist agenda. It really, it showed hmm. that, that um, the problems that we first saw in the sixties and seventies have not gone away. They went underground. Just like the like the first wave of modernism in the late 19th century 
you know, Pius X did his best to suppress it and to punish it and to eliminate it, but he didn't succeed. It went underground. And there were always quasi-modernist theologians working throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And then they emerged again uh, mm. rather triumphantly at the Second Vatican Council and afterwards. Um, so I think we're seeing something similar, uh, you know, that that the anti-traditionalists, um, many in, in a way, they kind of went underground uh, for a while. Mm. And, and at least during the 14 years of Sumorum Pontifico, maybe they felt they had to pretend uh, to go along with the company policy or something. Uh, and then, you know, with 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 Pope Francis, that mm. they really just come right out front and center again. Yes, no, that, that's that's a good analogy, I think, to modernism. Um, another analogy that's come to my mind is it, it is going back to the Deacon of Milan. It's almost like we have Julian the Apostate, right, <laughs> where he come yes. back, where there's a period of peace for the church, but there is a kind of a last, hopefully last in this case, uh, yeah. violent effort to reestablish, in that case, uh, paganism. But, but that yeah. leads us a little bit to um, what what do we do? What's our reaction to this? And I and there are, are two different schools of thought that not everybody always fits when you ever use a school of thought. People don't always fit neatly into them. But I sense a little bit even weaving its way through these contributions. So one is just I would put maybe Archbishop Vigano in this category. Just say no. Just we have nothing to do with this. This is utterly an invalid order. And we are just refusing to comply with it uh, because it's unjust, etc. And then uh, another approach, perhaps, of, well, we, we let's just sort of say, you know, what they want to hear in the sense or, you know, we don't question the Novus Ordo in any way or, or, or give the litmus tests that are asked for so we can sort of keep things going. And again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying. But what, what do you think about that as sort of a tension in terms of maybe poles of reaction and uh, what your thoughts are on that? Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, so there's the just say Viga no position, yes. right? <laughs> yes. uh, as it were. Um, yes. And and that that just you know that that would be that would be my stance. Um, right. That is to say, this document Traditions Custodes is theologically incoherent, canonically mm. untenable. Um, it's full of errors and contradictions. Um, mm. It's 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 contrary in certain respects, I would argue, although, you know, to make the argument that's I do that in one of the longer pieces in the book, mm. in a certain sense, it's against natural law and divine law yes. uh, when it comes to the preservation of the tradition of the church and the rights of the church. Um, so I think that it's it's a document that, you know, you can you can sort of pretend that it's that it's in force um, and mm. that and, and there and a lot of people just have to kind of dance around it mm. almost like they have to pretend that, you know, okay, this is the law of the land now, a little bit like Obergefell or something like that. You know, yes, it's yes. like, it's the law of the land, but it's not really, we know that it's not a just law and, and therefore it's not a law yes. at all. Yes. Um, and so I think people who take that side would say, look, you have to be prudent. You have to be clever. You have to work with whatever opportunities you have. Um, there may come a time for a bold, audacious stand mm -hmm. Um, that's not necessarily for everyone, every day, every moment. Uh, yes. you know, we have to discern these things. But there is that other side, too, that you see in some of the more, as it were, conservative contributors, um, where they, they say, oh, look, you know, um, traditionalists, you know, they, they, they've gotten out of hand. You know, they're really aggressive. They're very polemical. Mm -hmm. Um, people say that about me all the time, I, <laughs> I, you know, and, and, you know, they should eat humble pie and they should agree to celebrate the Novus Ordo at least once in a while. Uh, that is talking about, say, Ecclesia Dei Institutes, yes. former Ecclesia Dei Institutes. Um, you know, they, they, they should apologize, you know, they should, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think I, I understand why some people might hold that, but I think that that's, that's actually failing to recognize the kind of people we're dealing with mm. who are against the traditional liturgy. They're not interested in mercy. They're not interested in toleration. They want to, to stamp this out. They want it to go away. Pope, Pope Francis made no, no bones about that. And in fact, just, uh, just recently, Cardinal Supich uh, published an article at the, uh, the blog Pray Tell, which, uh, is, a, is something you should only read if, if it's assigned to his <laughs> penance. You know? uh, but but uh, he, there was a little article where he made, he made it absolutely clear. You know, he said, as bishop, I take very seriously my responsibility to bring all of my people to a unitary form of celebrating the 
Roman right, quote unquote, Roman right there, you know, and that just means the Novus Ordo at the end of the day. So yeah. I think that those who, those who compromise, who um, kowtow, who, you know, temporize and so on, that they're, they're kind of just setting themselves up for, um, for the fall. I mean, they're, they're not, mm. we, we can't be naive about this. We can be prudent, but we cannot be naive. We must not be. No, and I, I agree with you. I think on that issue, I, I fall more on your side. Although I do think it's important, in my opinion, that uh, we follow the example of Archbishop Vigano. As many know, I'm a great fan of the Archbishop. But, um, you know, he has been very bold. As we, you know, he's made, issued many bold statements. But he has always been very... <laughs> charitable even with those who with whom he disagrees so when he mm -hmm. first came out with his bold statements on vatican ii uh, he took some disagreement with the practical approach or the what do we do about it with another contributor in your book bishop schneider um and I, I, one of the things i noted at the time is how very respectful he was so i think yes. that's an important lesson that yes we, we certainly could disagree and i, I tend to share your view that the let's just sort of tell them what they need or do we need to get by is ultimately maybe not the best strategy, the best tactic. But I think we need to not lose sight of the end goal here and get lost yes. in a, a a sort of acrimonious war right. with those who, who for prudence or for various reasons and for their personal circumstances, you know, maybe need to follow that route right now. And again, I, I very yes. much admired Archbishop Vigano was very respectful of Bishop Snyder. And he doesn't sort of call him names. He just says, well, right. this is his approach to what to do. We both agree there's a problem. He has a different approach to the solution. I have a different approach. I think mine's right, but he doesn't do it in a way that is acrimonious or, or starting a war. Yes, I, I would I would certainly agree with that. I mean, this yeah. is not a time to burn bridges and blow up bridges. Yes. I mean, to the extent yes. that they exist. And I yes. think this book, this book is a testimony to that um, yes. because there are some authors who, who criticize uh, the traditionalists for yes. their attitude or their tactics or or their behavior or whatever it might be. Um, and I, I, I think that, that, that it's good for us to read that whether, you know, if the shoe fits, wear it, right? That's, yes. That would be the right yes. attitude. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the other point I wanted to make briefly is yes. I think there's a, a huge difference between diocesan clergy and the clergy who belong to something like the Institute yes. of Christ the King or the Fraternity of St. Peter. Um, the diocesan clergy are already in a, a more challenging uh, situation. They're they're like amphibians, right? They're living in mm. the Novus Ordo world and in the traditional Latin Mass world, uh, mm. and they often they 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 might prefer the traditional Latin Mass, or maybe they simply want to do each one as well as they can, and they try not mm. to have a preference. But whatever the case may be, they are really between a rock and a hard place because. Yes. Um, you know, they, they need to walk that fine line. They don't want to give up the, the the treasure of tradition that they've discovered. And that has often meant the revitalization of their priesthood. I mean, this is, there are just countless testimonies to that. So there are many priests who, who are in love with their vocations because of the traditional mass. I'm talking about diocesan clergy who normally celebrate the Novus Ordo. Um, so, I mean, the worst thing that can happen to them is for them to behave in such a way that their bishop will say, well, then I'm not going to let you celebrate the Latin mass, you know, and then they have to become, you know, they have, they have this crisis of conscience. Do I become a renegade? And so I, I think for them, they need to tread on eggshells. I mean, mm -hmm. at least in many cases, I think that's not, that's not anything we should, we should criticize in them if they are trying to be super cautious mm -hmm. about what they do. Um, but with the Fraternity of St. Peter, the Institute of Christ the King, the Institute of the Good Shepherd, you know, various groups uh, that were called the Ecclesia Dei groups, mm. the, um, the, the Sons of the Most Holy Redeemer would be another one, Transalpine Redemptorists. Mm -hmm. These groups were founded precisely to remain absolutely faithful to the liturgical tradition of the church. And not just that, but also the theological and canonical tradition of the church and the musical and the artistic and everything, the whole mm -hmm. tradition. And they should be radically faithful to that. If they, if they say, "Oh well, you know, actually, we're 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 ninety nine percent faithful to that tradition," but actually, we're going to let this one percent of mm -hmm. of the of the conciliar uh, reformation uh, to enter in. I mean, that's the that's the camel's nose in the tent. I mean, that, yes, it, it it means the end of their identity, the end of their mission, the end of their their. Um, their 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 charism their spirituality i mean this is you know this is a, a that would be a big big problem so i do i do see differences in different groups in the church 
Uh, absolutely. And, and you're right. For those, uh, again, somebody has to come with a new word because now Ecclesia Day communities is, I guess, outdated <laughs> since there's no Ecclesia Day commission. But, yeah. Yeah. but in a sense, this is really a, you know, it's an attack on the action of diocesan priests. Stop doing mm -hmm. this. But it really is an attack on the very being of these institutes. Mm -hmm. Sort of saying, we're, we're, uh, if what Pope, Pope Francis says is correct, this is all only for a time. Eventually, everybody has to move over. He's mm -hmm. basically saying the charism for which you are founded no longer exists in the church. Right, it's You're invalid. Indeed. It's it's like it's yes. like a sentence of euthanasia. You know. Yes. Uh, you you can you can live for another ten years, but then we're going to euthanize you. You know. Um, Which for them, I mean, really, is a moment of 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 ontological crisis. I mean, so are should we stand up for who we are? Which I would say yes. Or then why not just disband now? I mean, I'm, I'm yes. being facetious, but in a certain sense, if, if it, it is that one, then why, what what other reason do we have to exist? We could just yes. be a diocesan priest if if it's not for this mission. So again, well, I agree with you. I'd exert them yeah. to, to be faithful to who they are. Yeah. And now, now it's, it's also true that, I mean, in, in church, you know, the, the history of the church, as you know very well as a historian, uh, the, the history of the church is full of many surprises, many, yes. many surprising changes from one pontificate yes. to the next. Yes. Um, I mean, although, you know, although Pius XII, his record is not scot free in some no. respects, you know, the shift from Pius the Twelfth to John the Twenty Third. My goodness, what a dramatic yes. shift that was! Even the shift from John the Twenty Third to Paul the Sixth was a dramatic, was dramatic shift in many yes. ways. From Paul the Sixth, I'm not going to count John Paul the First, but from Paul the Sixth to John Paul the Second was, in some respects, a, a significant shift. Um, and again, from I mean, you know, there are bigger shifts and smaller shifts. But if you look at, let's say, if you look at the Renaissance period, the period of crisis of the of the Protestant revolt. Right, the, the change from one pontificate to the next can be quite dramatic. From from, yes. a, from a worldly Renaissance-minded pope to a reforming ascetical pope, you know, that, yes. that, who wanted to drive through long overdue church reforms. Yes, and so I think part of what's going on here is that some people are trying to lie low because they 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 think Pope Francis doesn't have long to live. Mm. Uh, you know, a year, two years, whatever it's going to be, we don't know. And there's going to be a new conclave, a messy, protracted, I, I don't know. I, I think the next conclave is going to be one of the most insane in the history of the church. Of course, we won't yes. know since we won't have like a, uh, you know, an inside camera or something. But <laughs> but I, I think it's going to be a, a very bitter uh, conclave uh, because I think, I think, I could be wrong, but I think a lot of cardinals at this point are actually alarmed at Pope Francis and what he's done, what he's been doing in the church and the chaos that he's been causing. Um, and so I, anyway, so I don't, I don't no, automatically it, it, assume we're yeah. going to get a Francis the second out of the next conclave. No, it's a good point. Cause the, there's a danger. I've seen some people sort of lose hope. Oh, Francis has packed the college. We're just going to get another Francis. <laughs> and, and a line from, if you don't mind me mentioning another person's book, but a, a, another book I'm looking at, Julia Mioni has just published a book on the St. Gallen mafia. Yes. And there's a line in there where she, she gathers some sources that I seem reliable that uh, Joseph Ratzinger or Benedict the 16th, when he resigned, he did so really believing that a different cardinal, and she names him, Cardinal Rini, would become the next pope. So in his mind, he sort of thought, okay, I'll resign. This is what will happen. Mm. And he was shocked uh, in a, in a, uh, that, that wow. Jorge Bergoglio was elected. Um, and that's the first time I've heard that reported. But Interesting. She reports that. But it, it struck home to me that we have to remember that, that no matter – from a natural level. And so here was the Pope who knows the church well from a natural level thinking this is what will happen at this conclave. Uh, it turned upside down in a, yes. in a bad way. But yes. we have to remember that can happen another way. And and God often will use unexpected people in even ways unintended by them. <laughs> so we, we should never just sort of throw up our hands and say, well, it's just hopeless. We're just going to get a, you know, Francis II. Um, yeah. It's not necessarily the case. So let me mention something yes. else too about the book that I think readers might might want Please. to know. You you had said earlier, and I appreciated it, that it's an easy book to read yes. because it's made up of seventy pieces. So I yes. thought I would mention that. Yes. Um, of these seventy pieces, it it actually falls into kind of three groups, three very unequal yes. groups. There are two pieces at the beginning that were written before yes. Traditiones Custodes, in a sense, preparing for it. You know, the, the responding to the rumors. Yes. Uh, and those are those are really good pieces. Then there are 67, 67 pieces written after the Modu Proprio came out. And then the final piece in the book, number 70, they're all numbered, uh, is the um, let me get the exact name of it. 
it is the letter of the faithful attached to the traditional mass to the Catholics of the whole world. Yes. That was published in six languages on the internet. Um, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful letter. It's a very short, simple letter signed by, and it's, it's, it's been signed now by about, um, I guess about 150 prominent Catholic lay people. It's just lay people lay saying people. we we love the tradition of the church. We are not going to give it up. We're not going to see our children deprived of it. We're not going to see religious and priestly vocations uh, obliterated because of, mm. of this motu proprio. Uh, so that it seemed to me that was a good way to end the book just with a, with a strong statement of principle from the laity, um, from the sheep that the shepherds are supposed yeah. to be <laughs> caring yes. for. Um, yes, but the the book also it has a it has a wide variety of genres in it. So it has newspaper articles, for mm -hmm. example, some famous articles by Ross Douthat uh, and uh, Michael Brendan Darty in the New York Times, the Wall Street yes. Journal. You know, we we had to get permission from these big newspapers to put these articles in from Le Figaro in mm -hmm. Paris, um, other you know other uh, ABC in Spain, various prominent newspapers in their own countries. Yes, um, the Spectator, uh, you know, and so forth. Um, we have essays, things that were written as essays online, um, interviews, several interviews, uh, and lectures. So um, Joseph Shaw has five pieces in this book. I have five pieces in it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Joseph Shaw, two of his pieces are lectures that he gave, which have never been published before. So if, if, yes. you, if you like Joseph Shaw, as I do very much, uh, his work is, is marvelous. Um, then you know you'll get those texts only in this book. They're not online, yes. um, and there are a few other examples like that. Uh, and then homilies. There are homilies in this book too. So it's it's quite a wide uh, variety of genres too, mm. which makes for I think for interesting reading. No, and it's important work, obviously, uh, for people now. But, uh, for example, that last letter, some people criticized uh, letters like that and that one, say, oh, what's the point? Why are you writing? Francis mm -hmm. isn't going to change his mind. And, and I might agree with that. I doubt this letter from 150 prominent Catholics will change his mind. We never know, though. Paul VI mm -hmm relented a little bit and granted an indult to England because Agatha Christie signed a, yes, a letter. <laughs> so you do never know. But again, even if I agree, you may not change his mind. The letters and, and the writings serve an important purpose, and that is the historical yeah. record, right? So that whenever it is two, three hundred years from now, people will say, you know what? There were Catholics who stood up and, and saw this and spoke out, and uh, that has an important value to set mm -hmm. the, the record straight. So I think yeah. that's, people sometimes miss that point. I, I would actually recommend uh, there's a, there's a publication. It's an online publication called Gregorius Manius. It's yes. The, it's the publication of the International Una Voce, Una Voce. Federation, of which yes. Dr. Shaw is, is the new president. Um, and and of course they were heavily involved this past weekend in the Populus Sumorum Pontificum pilgrimage. We yes. I think we need by the way we need a different name now for that yes uh, for the, for that pilgrimage. I think they yes. should just call it the Traditionis Custodes pilgrimage. But yes, it's, it's sort of an ironic uh, yes mode. But um, but Gregorius Manius, the most recent issue, I think it's issue number twelve, yes. <laughs> uh, has a. Um, has a really interesting article put together by, by Dr. Shaw um, talking about all the different important petitions that have been prepared over the years yes. from 1971, from the Agatha Christie letter, uh, all the way down to the present. And there are, there are, and these are important because they're not just, you know, anybody can sign these letters, but these are all prominent cultural yes. figures and intellectuals and politicians and so on. And it's just neat to see how every once in a while there's one of these petitions with prominent people, and sometimes they do have an effect, sometimes yes. they don't. But as you said, they're always there for the record. That what the, what it shows is there's all always been support for the preservation of the tradition of the church on the part yes. of, you know, obviously of lay people because the mass wouldn't exist if yes. nobody showed up for it. I mean, there might be private masses, but 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 on the part of prominent people, educated people, cultured people, you know, people yes. who know stuff about the world and the church and history and culture. Yes. Right? Um, and I think that's, that's important for the record. There's nothing it, it, like it that is. for the Novus Ordo. No, nobody, no, nobody, um, you know, it, it, imagine if somebody said, we're going to have this 38 mile pilgrimage. And at the end of it, we're going to have the Novus Ordo. Right. Actually, nobody would show up for that. Right. <laughs> yes. I mean, the, 
it doesn't. It, anyway, it doesn't happen. Started. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, aside from Archbishop Roach, who thinks it's the most beautiful, perfect missile ever issued by the church, uh, <laughs> to which I'm waiting for the Eastern patriarchs to object how unecumenical yes. he is by condemning the Eastern rites, which, yeah. <laughs> which you know, far it's funny. Yeah. It's, it's it's funny, uh, Brian. We're, we're probably running out of time, right? Yes. No, okay. a few minutes. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say it's, it's it's funny to me, and it's kind of sad, actually, it's rather pathetic, that um, you have people like Archbishop Roach and and uh, Cardinal Supich, I mentioned his article at Pretel, yes. they're just regurgitating the same superficial lines that were yes. being said in 1969 and 1970, as if there hasn't been 50 years yes. worth yes. of scholarship and research and apologetics and polemics and yes. demonstrations that all the things that they're saying, I mean, all the things they're saying have been completely exploded. Like yes. this missile is in continuity with tradition and blah, 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 blah. Right. I mean, it's embarrassing. I, yes. Do they realize, are they really so uneducated that they don't know that the claims they're making could be shot down by, you know, an 18 year old who's read enough right, yes. of, the, of the relevant literature. It's, it's, I guess I, maybe that's a good sign. They have no arguments for their position. <laughs> well, maybe they're the ones that are stuck in the past, which yeah, is very much Francis so. the, 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 the nostalgics for sure. <laughs> yes, yeah. for the 1970s. But well, thank you again for coming to to share with us a little insight into the the book. Again, it is available. I think literally just right off the presses uh, from Benedict's Peace to Francis's War. It's available from uh, Angelico Press. There's two different. Um, distribution channels, as you'll see on their website, that you can choose uh, to order from. Uh, it is really well worth your time. I would encourage you not only to read it yourself, but this is the kind of book we spoke about, Diocesan Priests, that, that maybe you know a diocesan priest who's thinking about these mm -hmm. issues. Uh, you could, you know, send that uh, to him. Send it to uh, the diocesan priest you may know, and um, uh, as a gift, or send it to some family members who have questions. Uh, really, could, could a book can serve many, many purposes like that. So order a few, uh, send them around, and uh, help help distribute, uh, again, this important collection. And thank you for your work in, in putting this together for us. Uh, you're, you're very welcome. It's, it's a blessing. It was really a privilege to work on this. Great. And we look forward uh, to seeing you again, hopefully on uh, this program, but also uh, at a uh, some point in the future, some more articles in Catholic Family News. They're always uh, wonderful to read. So thank you. Thank you so much. God bless.